In the morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ, how are you today? You're listening to St. Mark Babidji's podcast, a podcast of joy in the glory of Christ Jesus, our risen Savior. Thank you for listening today. You make this podcast what it is through your listening and sharing it with others. I am truly grateful that you have taken the time out to listen to our meditation on God's Word. Joy is something that is ours through the victory won for us over sin by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But what does joy look like? It can take many forms. Celebration is probably one that came to mind pretty quickly when I asked the question. When a son or daughter or a friend completes a journey, a difficult task, or earns that next step on whatever path that they're traveling, we rejoice with them. We might throw them a party. The more bold among us might sing some karaoke and and struggle to keep a straight face. Or... Maybe we're a bit more reserved, in a more intimate setting of a dinner over a fine meal and an adult beverage shared among family and close friends is more our style. But what do those people look like? They're all smiles, aren't they? With words of congratulations and encouragement for more endeavors in the future. Some of us may be more outdoorsy and our celebrations take place around a fire, singing songs and recounting stories of the excitement, the terror, failure, and the ultimate success of the events past. The point is, there's nothing stale or stodgy about celebrating victory. And a victory won for all time and eternity is worth celebrating forever. And the joy we have will never grow cold, because the victory won for us isn't just for us. It's renewed as our children are born and baptized. That victory is for them too. And when our friends come to faith, it's also renewed when they join our circle of celebration in Christ. And when some of our number pass on in faith to be joined with God, we still celebrate because we know that their joy is now complete and untainted by the sin and temporal pain that we endure right now. Our joy is continually renewed in Christ every day in every happening. No, life isn't all rainbows and unicorns. We all have real problems and real pain brought on by sin from us and others and just the world. But we can still celebrate with our friends and our family because we want to encourage them. And we can still have joy for ourselves because no matter how dire the circumstance we find ourselves in, it is only temporary if we have true life in Christ. So, show your joy always. Even in a liturgical service such as the one we use in a Wells church, don't say, Give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Shout out with enthusiasm that matches the joy in your heart. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. And when you sing, sing with the joy in your heart. And when you greet your brothers and sisters in Christ, greet them with the joy that you hold in your heart. For we truly have joy because the victory is His, and He holds the field victorious forever. And because He loves us, we share in the spoils of that victory life everlasting with our Creator. Today's meditation comes to us from St. John's Church in Woodlake, Minnesota. Pastor Cowie's sermon is simply titled, Reformation. Let's listen together. There are many who think that the Word of God and the Christians who hear and believe the Word of God are dangerous. They claim, they think, they feel that the Word of God and those who believe it are are guilty of inciting violence. Literal violence, they say. And for this reason, they feel quite just justified in their attempts to silence or to suppress what they consider, what we consider, and here is the Word of God, what they consider to be hate speech. But this is nothing new. It was an accusation leveled against God's prophets of old. It was true of the preaching of John the Baptist who was silenced by the cutting off of his head. It is essentially the the charge against Jesus that his ideas were dangerous 
He was accused of tearing down the temple. St. Paul, likewise, was accused of, of inciting riots, violence. And fast forward to the Lutheran Reformation. And it is the preaching of Martin Luther that, that men are saved by, by God's grace alone through faith and not by the works of the law that was deemed dangerous. And they felt like people were, were gab getting so riled up and out of control that it simply had to be stopped. On the other hand, there are also those, or that many who would disagree that the word of God incites violence. And indeed, the, the Bible teaches the way of love and of peace. Many would say, therefore, that, that Christians are in all occasions to be against violence and are to be promoters of tolerance and peace and generally to mind their own business and keep their mouths shut. In other words, that religion just is never something to argue about or fight over. It would appear, at least from the words of our gospel for today, that Jesus would agree with the former. Jesus would agree that the word of God does incite violence, a kind of it. But what does this mean? The words that Jesus speaks in our, in our gospel today, in Matthew 11, are a little tricky. What he's talking about, he's talking about John the Baptist, who already at this time was already in prison for his preaching, and Jesus is talking about the fruits, the results of John's preaching. He says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. At first reading, it might seem that Jesus was talking about the enemies of the gospel who use force and violence to attack and attempt to destroy the kingdom of heaven. Like King Herod, for example, and his sword or like the leaders of the Jews, or uh, who arrest Jesus, or the Romans who crucify him. Or any number of opponents of Christ and his gospel throughout time who have attempted to snuff out the preaching of the word by violent force. But notice the second half of Jesus' sentence. First, he says that from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. And then he says, and the violent take it by force. You see, the enemies of Christ, try as they may, cannot wrest the kingdom from thy son. They can't take it. The kingdom of heaven cannot, can never be taken except by those to whom it is given. Who is it that has stormed the gates of the kingdom of heaven by force? It is you. The kingdom of heaven cannot be taken except by those to whom it is given. And, and Jesus himself says, we heard it in our verse of the day, Jesus says, have no fear, little flock, for the Father the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The kingdom of God belongs to the children of God. But they are not by nature children of God. By nature, we are enemies of God opponents of God, outside of his kingdom. How, how is it, how could it be that we could become his children? How do we get the kingdom? Well, Jesus continues. He says, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. What did they prophesy? 
St. Paul in our epistle says the law and the prophets testify to this. To what, he says? Paul says, to the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. The law and the prophets, John the Baptist, St. Paul, and Christian preachers in every generation alike preach, they prophesy, they testify to this. That repentance and forgiveness of sins for Jesus' sake, for free, by grace, not by the works of the law. And this word, this preaching, does something. It does something to those who hear it. We might say it incites violence, as it were. That is, it awakens you. It lights a fire under our hearts to take hold of that gospel promise and to take possession of the promised kingdom and to let no one stand in our way until it is. Martin Luther, in a, in a comment on this, this verse, he explains this violence by which the kingdom of God is taken. He says, as nothing other than that people love the word vehemently and give it pride of place before all the goods of life and body. The prophets prophesy, the preachers preach, Christ speaks, and his word enlivens our hearts with faith, with faith which fervently lays hold of the promised kingdom. Another theologian writes it this way, he says, with this expression, suffers violence, Christ wanted to describe the nature and property of justifying faith. Namely, that it's not aimless knowledge. It's not cold thinking, but a very ardent disposition of the heart, which fervent desire, wrestling and striving through all obstacles, sighing, seeking and trusting, Drive faith to that point that it so seeks, embraces, and plans to hold on to the kingdom of heaven, which the word is offering, in the same way as those try to invade and occupy some place by violence, who spare no labors and are frightened by no perils to accomplish this. The word of God causes us to stop at nothing, to enter it, and to take it, as if by force. It is not by rights ours. And nevertheless, we take our place in it boldly, confidently, forcefully even, by this word, this promise, by grace, by faith. If only... The, the truth is, though, that it's not our violent acts. And it's not our good deeds or even our desire, our will for the kingdom that brings us into God's kingdom. Only the righteousness of his son. Only his grace and mercy given to us as gift. Only the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. But the preaching of the gospel lights a fire under. It moves us to a fighting ferocity, an intense love and desire for that word which delivers this promise to us. While at the same time, this preaching then also rebukes all indifference. It rebukes any complacency, all self-satisfaction with regard to the preaching of the word of God. That would be a warning to you. If the word of God does not incite you to a little violence, that is, if it does not rouse in you a passion for in you to lay hold of what it holds out to you, it's a warning that if you wouldn't fight for it, you may have already lost it. 
it would be a rebuke to those who think Christianity, they, they call themselves Christian, they think that, that Christianity is fine, as long as Christians behave themselves and don't get riled up or say something or some doctrine or some behavior is wrong. As long as you don't go suggesting that Christians actually ought to live differently than the unbelieving world around them. That's fine, as long as you don't challenge or critique my lifestyle or my choices. It's fine, as long as I'm not made uncomfortable in any way or be asked to repent. But fortunately for us, the word of God is still preached to you and still inciting you, riling you up. It preaches repentance. That does incite the daily killing, not of some person or force, but the daily killing of your sinful flesh. Drowning your old Adam in baptismal waters every day in daily contrition. And it works to fire up in me, fire me up to root out all evil, to, to cut out of my life everything that would lead me astray. Fires me up to be fanatical, forceful even in my daily need, my desperate need for continual growth in the Word of God through Bible study, through daily devotion and daily prayer. The Word of God creates in Christians a desire to love all the more this Word of God. Nothing to stop us from receiving it. Perhaps I can give you just two illustrations, Ill examples in the life of the church in which this could be seen, imagined. In the divine service, the gifts of Christ, all the gifts of Christ could be summarized by the symbol of the cross. And it's often done just that way, drawn as a cross in the air over people of God. As shorthand, for everything that Jesus has won and accomplished, everything that Jesus has done on his cross and now wishes to give to you. So it is that the pastor marks you, God's people, with the sign of the cross at, at times like the invocation or the absolution, blessing. I've often thought about it in this way and, and explained it. One way of thinking of the sign of the cross that is made upon a person, it is as though one is so moved by the word of God and the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ for me that when you see that cross made over you, it is as though you reached out, reached toward the front of the church and grabbed it through the air and pulled it violently, yanking it to yourself, from him to you, saying to yourself, that cross of Jesus and everything that he's done for you is mine. I am a child of God. I have the forgiveness of sins. I have God's blessing upon me. Secondly, concerning the reception of Holy Communion and Holy Absolution, Luther rightly teaches that pastors are, are to compel no one to receive it at any given time or place or in any way force them. But he says that they, preachers, are to preach in such a way that people will come of their own accord and even, he says, even compel their pastors to give it, it as if they would be moved by the word and promise of God so forcefully to violently, Luther mentions a, a parishioner grabbing his preacher, his pastor by the lapels and demanding the sacrament, to demand what is theirs by promise. Of course, neither we nor Jesus are advocating an actual incitement to physical violence against the person of any person. Certainly not against the kingdoms of this world. We are no match for them. We would lose. Against these, we'll let Jesus fight for us. But rather that Jesus teaches that the preaching of the word of God creates a faith in us that loves the word of God deeply. 
fervently. And that will insist, even forcefully, will insist upon hearing it attentively, faithfully, regularly, and would even fight. It would give up anything, even fight rather to avoid letting go of it, losing it, softening it or weakening it, or ever giving it up. A faith that would lead us to cry as we do in the hymn and take they our life. Goods, fame, child, and wife, let these all be gone. They yet have nothing won. The kingdom, ours, remaineth. Amen. We hope that today's meditation on God's Word has enriched you. Divine services are held right here in Bemidji, Minnesota at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Sunday school and adult Bible study is also offered between our Sunday services at 9.15 a.m. Our church services are live-streamed at 8 a.m. on Sunday mornings and are available afterwards on our channel, St. Mark Lutheran Church, Bemidji. If you're listening or watching this podcast, you are cordially invited to join us in person next week and every week. This is our fourth year producing this podcast, and there is a large archive of devotional material online available if you want to learn more about God and His Word. Visit www.stmarkbemidji.org or look in the show notes in this podcast for a link to this and many other meditations on God. You can also search for St. Mark Bemidji on YouTube to find our channel. If you have any questions or you would like more information about our church and its ministry, please visit our website, which is once again, www.stmarkbemidji.org All scripture readings are taken from the Holy Bible, New International Version, copyright 2011, and are used by permission from Zondervan. Meditation's daily devotional is published by Northwestern Publishing House and is also used by permission. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider subscribing and telling a friend. May God bless the rest of your day. He, because I could not pay it, gave my full redemption price. Do I need of treasures many? I have one worth more than any. That brought me salvation free, lasting to eternity.